Amanda. I got gotcha, you. I got gotcha. you. Hi, Phil. What's up? She's not in today, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I did not. Hi, Phil. Can you not hear me? I heard you. I hear her in this. I, I think I heard her brief, sort of softly in the studio, but not. Um, I left my high heels at the panel this morning. I'm currently wearing snow you boots. You um, it you. looks super. Where are you from? Long Island. I grew up. <laughs> but you've been in Chicago for a while, right? 46 years. Oh, you're a native Chicago at that point. Do you root for? Do you root for Chicago? Under the circumstances. Talk again. I gave you my whole spiel. It was really dull. I don't know what left I have to say, to at least for world. the whole world to hear. Oh, now I hear myself. Phil, can you hear me? Phil? I can hear you, Amanda. Thank you. Uh, he can hear me. Wednesday, November 13th. Coming up on this program. Vote on a Chicago casino, that and more from Springfield. Mayor Lori Lightfoot is making a striking claim against Uber, the latest on a proposed rideshare tax. And behind the scenes at Steppenwolf with the Lady Smith Black Mambazo. But first tonight, we start with the impeachment inquiry into President Donald Trump. Public hearings began today with the testimony and questioning of diplomats Bill Taylor and George Kent. In a new revelation, Taylor testified that he was told in July of a phone call where President Trump admitted he was more interested in investigating the Bidens than in Ukraine. A short while ago, I spoke with Illinois Congressman Mike Quigley, a Democrat who serves on the House Intelligence Committee, and I began by asking him about Taylor's testimony today. I think it's just one more step in the evidentiary process. Uh, I, I think when you uh, read the transcript from the White House, you, you can glean that. Uh, I don't think there's anything that's contradicted the fact that the president's interest in Ukraine was singularly about himself altering uh, years of regular U.S. policy for, for political gain. Even though it may be just another step, Republicans are saying that uh, it amounts to hearsay since uh, one diplomat is reporting what somebody else told him about what he heard. Is it hearsay? Well, first of all, the hypocrisy reigns. Uh, they're worried about the evidence, yet they're blocking. We haven't been able to get a single document from any agency, including the White House. And they have blocked over a dozen witnesses from testifying, uh, including Mick Mulvaney and Mr. Bolt, people with extraordinary access to information. And their attacks on hearsay indicate that they really don't understand the law. Uh, ev hearsay evidence is extraordinarily admissible under 23 exceptions under federal law, clearly under instances like this. Uh, the bigger picture there, they're worried about process because they don't know they don't want to talk about what the president did. They don't want to talk about the president's misdeeds. They want to talk about as they have the entire process about anything but those acts. Congressman, Republicans today referenced several occasions where Ukrainian President Zelensky uh, is said to have said that he felt no pressure from the White House. Does this uh, take some of the air out of the accusation that there was a quid pro quo? I think it's clear from the testimony that the American public can read and will soon see on TV is that the last thing Ukraine want to do is get involved in our political mess. Uh, and it's obvious that in the president of the United States, uh, the commander in chief says something, they're very wary of it. So I, I think they're also very concerned about alienating the president, the same president that held their military aid. I wouldn't want to bother him. I wouldn't want to offend him either. 
So I think they're being very cautious. Another thing one of the Republicans uh, asserted today was that because uh, aid ultimately did flow to Ukraine, that there was no quid pro quo. Yeah, first, there doesn't have to be a quid pro quo for there to be a crime. Uh, the president extorted uh, another government as most vulnerable state. Uh, second, the only reason that aid was released is because uh, the whistleblower's complaint made it public. Congress found out about it, and the president heard from uh, many congressional leaders. So if it had been kept secret, uh, they wouldn't have known about it till the first uh, aid dollar didn't come through after September. Republicans have also issued a list of the witnesses they want to see, including Hunter Biden. Uh, is there any way that would happen? I think that uh, three of their witnesses have been approved for next week because they're relevant. Uh, but I reminded them today that uh, this is the nation's capital. It's not Area 51. Uh, if you want to talk about crazy debunked conspiracy theories, uh, you can go there. But it has no business in the nation's capital as serious as this matter is. So uh, why not? Uh, why do Democrats uh, say that Hunter Biden is not, uh, is not an appropriate witness? Well, look, uh, many told uh, Rudy Giuliani that uh, the person who had made these allegations uh, was not a credible witness. The investigation, as far as it went, found absolutely no credible evidence that there was any wrongdoing. So uh, I guess they're grasping at straws to find something that has been disproven so far. And that is a strategy all along. Oh, yeah, well, what about you? Uh, it doesn't belie the fact that the president of the United States uh, committed a, an atrocious crime here uh, with, a, with an ally at war with Russia, threatening to withhold aid, which keeps them safe, which keeps the Russians at bay. The mere fact that that news could have gotten out sooner uh, would have made it much easier for the Russians to act on. So. The, Basically, what happened is we put their national security and our national security at risk, again, for the president's game. Congressman, quickly, thank you so much for joining us. We very much appreciate it. Thank you. Anytime. And now to analysis of today's public impeachment inquiry hearings from three local legal minds, and they are Renato Mariotti, a former federal prosecutor and partner at the law firm Thompson Coburn. Martin Reddish, a professor of law and public policy at Northwestern University, and former Cook County Republican Party General Counsel Christine Svensson of Svensson Law Offices. Welcome all to Chicago tonight. Martin Reddish, for those who may not be following the impeachment proceedings closely, just give us a statement of the case. What's at issue? The basic question is, did the President of the United States sacrifice the national interest to pursue his own personal interest. As a result, did he, in effect, violate the public trust and his, his oath to support the Constitution and protect the nation? Renato Mariotti, as Democrats go uh, forward with this process, this inquiry that could lead to impeachment, uh, what's your take on, uh, on, on how they're doing it? Is it fair? I think it's in accordance with how impeachment has been done in the past. Uh, I think today the Republicans got plenty of time to make the arguments that they wanted to make. If anything, I think they had trouble filling up the time. Uh, I think the issue right now is really that there's overwhelming evidence of this quid pro quo. And I think a lot of Republicans are you know, making the argument that really they should admit that and argue that it's not an impeachable offense. I think that would be a smarter move uh, for the president. Uh, to make. He's not willing to do that. And so I think right now uh, there's a lot of effort being put to prove that, uh, even though I think uh, in the end that's going to ultimately be uh, very well established. Christine Spencer, how about that question? If the Democrats were to prove their allegations, is it an impeachable offense for the president to have uh, put pressure on Ukraine by way of withholding military aid in exchange for their investigating a domestic political rival? No, it's not. Um, and I, I believe that Professor Reddish actually explained uh, the actual impeachable offenses better than Democrats have. Uh, so, no, uh, putting pressure, first of all, he didn't put pressure on. And the transcript itself is the best evidence of the fact that there was no pressure and the fact that uh, President Zelensky actually said that he didn't feel any pressure. Uh, but, no, uh, the president needs to have leeway to investigate corruption in foreign countries. He was asking 
President Zelensky to investigate corruption. That's exactly the job of the president. Is that the job of the president? Is that what uh, he was asking Ukrainians? If he wants to investigate corruption, he can call the FBI. The FBI, the DOJ are under control. And the reason the president of the United States didn't pick up the phone and call the DOJ or FBI, which would have been a problematic in itself, a politically minded investigation, but at least would have been a proper law enforcement avenue. He was going to Ukraine is because this was not about investigating corruption. This was about digging up dirt on his political rights. As you just heard, two career diplomats testify under oath today. Martin Reddish, as a matter of law, is this, a, is this a legal question or a political question? Say the Democrats are able to establish that uh, the president uh, did everything that they're accusing him of. By definition, is that an impeachable offense? There's no way to specifically determine that. Uh, the courts will not enter this, this matter. It'll be up to the House and the Senate to determine for themselves. Basically, the way the Democrats are approaching it, it's it's uh, a ABC. They've they they've uh, alleged a, a basic abuse of power, uh, bribery, and corruption, and you can make that case. It, really, I agree with Bernardo. The, the evidence is clear. We know what what's gone on here. Uh, if you look at that quasi transcript of a call, the word corruption isn't even mentioned. The Bidens are, are mentioned. CrowdStrike is mentioned. Uh, it, it's quite clear what the dynamic was here. The question is, do, do we want to call it an impeachable offense? And uh, Christine Svensson, uh, do you think the evidence is clear that, uh, that uh, uh, those actions were in fact taken? But your argument is that, so what, it's not an impeachable offense even if, even if he did all that? Correct. I think it's very unclear as far as uh, what it was that President Trump uh, was, was questioning uh, Zelensky about, but no, there's no, there was no quid pro quo in that transcript. And it's interesting that the Democrats keep on going back and forth between, oh, we have to prove quid pro quo, we have to prove bribery, oh, it's just a pressure situation on the Ukrainians. Which one is it? I mean, I think they're very confused about where they're supposed to go with this. Well, let's go back to uh, the hearings today. Uh, Val Demings, who was a Democratic congresswoman from Florida, asked both witnesses about uh, the president's personal attorney, Rudy Giuliani, and his dealings with Ukraine. Was Mr. U Giuliani promoting U.S. national interests or policy in Ukraine, Ambassador? I don't think so, ma'am. Mr. Kent? No, he was not. What interests do you believe he was uh, promoting, Mr. Kent? I believe he was looking to dig up political dirt against a potential rival in the next election cycle. Ambassador Taylor? What interests do you believe he was promoting? I agree with uh, Mr. Kent. Renato Mariotti, what did you make of the two witnesses today in terms of their credibility, how they came across, and so forth? Uh, they're very strong witnesses. I think it's clear uh, why the Democrats chose them first. I mean, Mr. Taylor, for example, graduated in the top 1% of his class at West Point. He received a Bronze Star for valor in Vietnam. Uh, he has served every administration since Reagan. He was somebody who was recruited to join the Trump administration by Mike Pompeo, the Secretary of State. Uh, he is not a partisan, and at times uh, he would uh, say things that were positive about the administration, for example, that Obama didn't, President Obama did not approve certain uh, military aid to Ukraine that, that President Trump did. Uh, he, he came off to me like somebody who didn't have an ax to grind, but was uh, telling it straight. And I think we're going to hear a lot more witnesses like him in the... In the Christine week, uh, Svensson, your reaction to the two witnesses? So I believe that the witnesses were trying to do the right thing, uh, but I found their testimony to be very weak. Essentially, all that they really said, especially Taylor, was that... His aide overheard Sondland talking to the president the day after the, the Zelensky phone call and then Sondland's alleged impression of that phone call that this aide overheard that he then told to Taylor. That's triple hearsay. That's inadmissible. That means nothing. Martin Reddish, uh, Republicans have, uh, in addition to Christine Svensson, have been saying that. Uh, is that hearsay? Is that uh, weak evidence? My entire evidence course was, in law school was examining all the exceptions to hearsay. I think there are about 850. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's really not the point here. Congress isn't controlled by the federal rules of evidence. Uh, the barrier to hearsay is in some ways archaic. Uh, evidence can be probative even if it isn't direct. And in this case, the fact that Sondland actually said something uh, about Trump 
being concerned more with the Bidens than with Ukraine is itself probative. Why would Sondland say that? And Taylor was uh, Taylor's assistant was an eyewitness to that, and his deposition is, is scheduled already to be taken. Uh, let's talk about uh, let's talk about uh, another point that Republicans are making, uh, Renato Mariotti, and that is that Hunter Biden and Burisma Holdings should be on the table along with these other issues, should they? Well, they're not relevant to the issues here. I mean, in other words, Hunter Biden's not under investigation. Donald Trump is under investigation here. Uh, and the, the issue is really, what did Donald Trump do? Why did he do it? What was his intent? Uh, whatever Hunter Biden was doing in Ukraine, one way or the other, is not relevant to those issues. So there's not a judge in this country uh, in a trial uh, of this issue that would permit Hunter Biden's testimony because he has nothing to say about the issues involved. He didn't serve in the Trump administration, wasn't talking to Sondland or Trump or Taylor or anybody involved in this. Hunter Biden not relevant, uh, Christine Svensson? Uh, he is relevant. His testimony would be relevant. Uh, why is the whistleblower, though, not here? Why is it that Adam Schiff, um, who colluded to um, write the whistleblower's statements, and all of a sudden, you know, not bringing him, producing him? So they have, the Democrats have real problems with their process. Whistleblower should, uh, should be uh, testifying along with these other witnesses? The whistleblower is completely irrelevant at this point. Why? He, because he's the one who originally reported the matter, and we have since gained considerable evidence independent of what the whistleblower said. The whistleblower is supposed to be protected uh, because of possible dangers that could come if his name were revealed. This is just the Republicans pointing to a shiny object, look over there. There's really no relevance uh, at all. And the process, if you look at what the Democrats have done, there's been no impropriety in the processes at all. Uh, they've engaged in investigation. They've given the Republicans the opportunity to ask questions. Uh, this is the process that is normally used in an impeachment proceeding. That's where we'll have to leave it, but we're very appreciative of all three of you being here. Thank you very much, Renata Mariotti, Martin Reddish, and Christine Svensson. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And there's more Chicago Tonight just ahead, so please stay with us. This evening's presentation of Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by North Shore University Health System. Here's to the end of illness and the beginning of how healthcare should be. At North Shore, we're transforming your healthcare by analyzing your DNA to identify future health risks for you and working to stop illness before it begins. When you're a North Shore patient, your advanced primary care physician makes the latest genetic science part of your everyday care to keep you healthier longer. Advanced primary care. Here's to taking control of your health and taking on what's next. Well, it's no dice on a Chicago casino deal, so far anyway, but Illinois lawmakers have one day left in their veto session. Chicago Tonight's Amanda Vinicky reports on what happened in the State House today. She joins us now live from Springfield. Amanda, what happened? Well, Phil, as anybody who has watched this show or opened a Chicago newspaper knows, Illinois' pensions continue to be a major weight on the state. Lawmakers didn't touch that, didn't do anything about that $133 billion unfunded liability, but they did take action to come to the aid of local pensions. They moved to the House, that is, this evening, passing a measure that would essentially consolidate some 650 different local police and firefighter pension funds not including Chicago's, down into just two that would allow them to pool their assets and hopefully the game would be to make a greater return on those investments. Advocates say that this will help communities that are struggling to pay what is owed to those local pension funds. In Peoria, we are down 21 police officers, positions that are unfilled because we simply cannot afford the pension obligations that are required for our public safety employees. In the fire department, we're down two engine companies, 15 firefighters. This was Governor J.B. Pritzker's major initiative for the veto session, so it would have been seen as a big loss if he had faltered. It did take some fits and starts, but we, it does look like he's going to get a win there with the Senate set to take that up tomorrow. We did see, however, during this veto session, some other major initiatives stall, including an effort to further restrict 
these medical instrument sterilization companies from using and then emitting a cancer-causing gas, ethylene oxide. With every breath that our children are taking, they're breathing in a potent cancer-causing gas. Our children are playing the DNA equivalent game of a Russian roulette game with every breath that they take. Medline will scare you that House Bill 3888 will cause a sterile supply shortage. Do not believe them. We often hear that alternatives, uh, that there are alternatives to use ethylene oxide in the sterilization process, and that's simply not the case. There are not alternatives to ethylene oxide in a lot of cases, and I'll, I'll go on to talk about that. But also, I think it's a little ridiculous to say to a company, we're going to regulate you so you have to move, but please stay in the state. No company would do that. Now, this legislation would have essentially phased out the use of ethylene oxide in populated areas, namely the aim here in Waukegan, but it was a compromise bill and seen as less stringent than would have originally happened. So this issue is not going to go anywhere. The advocates on this issue are very motivated. We also saw a Senate committee hold off on banning flavored vaping products. Amanda Mayor Lightfoot was in Springfield yesterday. What was she doing there and did it make any difference? She was here to try and drum up support for some initiatives that are key to her agenda for the city. And among them is getting what she frames as a fix on the tax structure that's set in current law for a Chicago casino that she hopes to bring to the city. As you put it earlier, there is no dice on that yet anyway. The governor also wants a deal on this, as does Senate President John Cullerton. The state counts on the proceeds from this aspirational Chicago casino to pay for infrastructure projects statewide. And according to an independent study, no casino operator is going to want to come to, come to Chicago to run one unless the taxes and fees that would have to be paid are lowered. We've got to open the Chicago casino. If we don't open a Chicago casino, our vertical capital bill will be in destitute, in my mind. The tax rate that Chicago is paying it will still be higher than all the casinos in the state other than their own. So it's not like they're getting a, a special deal. Legislators from outside Chicago were hesitant for many reasons. Among them, they see it as the city getting a break to their detriment. How do we tell all these other communities that are, of, that are gaming in economically depressed areas that are struggling that Chicago is going to get a better deal with paying the state than everyone else? And then how do we tell others that the capital plan is going to receive $140 million a year less in revenue, which means a lot of capital projects throughout the state are not going to get done now? Negoti negotiations on that continued all day this evening. In fact, the Senate was set to take up a framework for this casino deal, but then held off because the city is apparently in, quote, active negotiations. So the mayor not folding her cards yet earlier today, saying that the deal is not yet dead. There is still one day left of the veto session tomorrow to make it happen. A big push, but technically possible. Back to you. Amanda, thank you. With an expected $50 million real estate transfer tax authorization from Springfield, a budget plan B starts to emerge. But there's confusion as to what that means for property taxes or what it might mean. Parrish Schutz has the latest on that and other news from a city council meeting today, including the mayor's bombshell claim about rideshare companies. Paris, tell to us To that, that bombshell claim, Phil, the mayor alleged today that rideshare giant Uber had offered to pay off black ministers to the tune of $54 million if they would join a campaign to publicly oppose the mayor's proposed $40 million rideshare tax. Uber says that is not true, and Lightfoot says ministers told her of this alleged plan. They offered up black ministers $54 million, a one-time deal, if they would convince the mayor um, to do away with any other kind of regulation. And as we walked these ministers through the realities of what's actually um, at stake here, I think they realized that, frankly, they'd been hoodwinked. Indeed, there were some 
African American ministers that publicly opposed the tax, saying it would hurt minority communities that don't have good access to public transit or taxi service. Uber, in fact, coordinated a minister to appear here on this show to make that case. A minister we spoke with said no money ever changed hands from Uber or Lyft. Uber itself did not answer whether any money changed hands here, but said the $54 million was flat out wrong. Quote, the mayor is entitled to her own opinion, but not her own facts. Weeks ago, we shared a proposal that would have raised $54 million for the city. She is confusing this figure. Now, the mayor's plan proposes raising the rideshare fee by 53 cents for all shared rides, so Uber Pool, to and from the loop, and by 228 for solo rides. Elsewhere in the city, solo rides would go up 53 percent. Uber has proposed its own counteroffer. It would divide the city into three zones here, a high and a medium and a low taxing zone, and their taxes would go up from 25 to 42 cents for shared riders and from 30 to 85 cents for solo riders. They say this plan is more equitable and will raise more money. Now, earlier in the day, we spoke with Alderman Jason Irvin, the chair of the Black Caucus, and he told us he wanted Lightfoot to consider the Uber proposal. There was some expansion uh, talked about in the ride share uh, with, that I looked at that would actually provide some relief to residents that live on the south and west side, and I begin I continue to push that uh, with the administration. I know we're trying to deal with the congestion uh, somewhat on the north and in parts of the north lakefront and then a little bit of the north side of Chicago. I think all of those options need to be put on the table before we go back to the taxpayers for property tax increase. Paris, you heard Amanda report earlier that the real estate transfer tax increase is dead. So how is the city planning to make up that shortfall? Right. It looks like no casino, no real estate transfer tax that the mayor wanted Springfield to authorize for the city. That was going to be $50 million she was relying on. She says it's just going to have to come from cuts and hiring freezes. Meanwhile, one of her toughest critics says her numbers don't add up, including an anticipated $163 million in federal aid or reimbursement she expects for ambulance services. A lot of ifs, ands, and maybes in this budget, including the biggest maybe of all, whether or not Donald Trump's going to give us $163 million for ambulance reimbursement. And if we don't get it, that means we're going to be back here telling our property taxpayers we need $163 million plus $65 million for a $200 plus million dollar property tax increase. Never was this budget balanced, and it's still not balanced. It's only put together by whiteout and scratch marks to make it look balanced on paper. Lopez also accuses the mayor of raising property taxes more than she had promised. Lightfoot said, no, that's not true. Any additional property tax hike that comes down the pike was already voted on before she took over. Ray Lopez apparently forgot that he voted for a property tax increase earlier this year that was proposed by former Mayor Emanuel, um, and so he got it 100 percent wrong. So there's nothing new regarding property taxes. So six weeks or so, Phil, until this budget has to be approved, closing an $838 million budget gap. There'll be probably two more city council meetings or so uh, before this all gets ironed out. One other item today, Alderman Michelle Smith and Matt O'Shea introduced an ordinance to ban any of their colleagues and themselves from being a lobbyist mm -hmm. as a side job. So acting as a paid lobbyist and going and lobbying any other government. They also want to ban any, any other public official, say from Springfield or anything like that, from coming and lobbying city council on behalf of any private entity. This in the wake of the charge brought against former state rep Luis Arroyo of bribery. Paris, thank you. A change in leadership for a Chicago sports team. Brandis Friedman has that story and more. What's making news in Chicago tonight? Brandis. And Phil, the Chicago Fire is fanning the flames today, letting go of coach Veljko Paunovic after four seasons. The 42-year-old Serbian led the Fire to a disappointing 41-58-37 record during his time with one playoff appearance. The Major League Soccer team announced the change today along with letting go of two assistant coaches, the goalkeeper coach, and others. This all comes just after owner Joe Mansueto purchased full control of the team ahead of the move to Soldier Field next season. Former Chicago Bears player Israel Adonage is the driving force behind an innovative new hub for family foundations and other philanthropic organizations. If you want an office, you can get an additional office. We have 15 conference rooms where you can now meet, host your meetings. You have a place right here in the heart of the city in the loop where you can connect 
and, and really just plant a flag for the work that you're looking to do. Adan Jay broke ground today on the future 45,000 square foot fabric, that's FBRK, impact house in the loop. A collaboration between him, the Field Foundation of Illinois, Forefront, and the Woods Fund, among others. The fabric impact house will occupy three floors and include a restaurant, conference rooms, podcast rooms, and programming to allow similar organizations to connect and collaborate. It opens in March. If you're traveling for Thanksgiving this year, pack your patience. The Transportation Security Administration says it's expecting to screen 4% more people this year during the 10 days around Thanksgiving compared to last year. That's 26.8 million passengers and crew members. U.S. airlines are adding about 850 additional flights and 108,000 seats per day to accommodate the increased travel. As for the weather now, tonight, a 50% chance of snow with a low around 23. Then tomorrow, decrease in clouds with a high of 32. And now, Phil, back to you. Thank you, Brandis. Still to come on Chicago Tonight, U.S. Attorney John Lausch talks about his office's role in reducing the city's gun violence. Behind the scenes at Steppenwolf Theater with Lady Smith Black Mambazo. And what does a train ride and an army parade have in common? Jeffrey Bear investigates two publicity stunts in tonight's Ask Jeffrey. But first, some of today's top business headlines, and here's Crane Chicago business editor Ann Dwyer. Thanks, Phil. Abbott Laboratories announced their CEO will step down early next year. During his 20-plus years at the helm, Miles White transformed the North Chicago-based healthcare products maker with a series of acquisitions and spin-offs. The most notable of those deals was the 2001 acquisition of the arthritis drug Humira. Humira went on to become the highest-selling prescription drug in the world. While White was CEO, Abbott's revenues more than doubled to just under $37 billion last year. White is set to become executive chairman. His successor as CEO will be the current chief operating officer, Robert Ford. Meanwhile, McDonald's is grappling with an unexpected problem in its transition to electronic ordering kiosks. The digital self-ordering kiosks are a huge part of the fast food giant's growth plans, but Bloomberg reports a recent test shows the kiosks may need to be replaced or retrofitted to accommodate cash transactions. McDonald's has rolled out the kiosks to about 9,000 domestic locations. One analyst estimates that 30 percent of fast food consumers consumers in the U.S. use cash. And finally, Amazon opened a so-called four-star store today in Oak Brook, marking the tech giant's first such outlet in the Chicago area. The brick-and-mortar store will carry items that have four or more stars on Amazon, featuring bestsellers in electronics, toys, books, kitchen, and homeware. The Oak Brook Center outpost is located in part of a former Sears site. This is Amazon's seventh four-star store in the nation. For Crane Chicago Business and ChicagoBusiness.com, I'm Ann Dwyer. Back to you, Phil. Thank you, Ann. And now a pair of shots and a look at combating gun violence through the lens of prosecution. Paris. Chicago's violence numbers are improving but are still staggering. Hundreds of people are killed every year on the streets of Chicago, more than Los Angeles and New York combined. As part of ongoing coverage, we recently brought you stories from those who have experienced gun violence firsthand and those who are working on solutions to end it. But what can federal prosecutors do to help in that battle? Joining us now for a one-on-one -on -one is John Lausch, Jr., the United States Attorney for the Northern District of Illinois. U.S. Attorney Lausch, thank you so much for being thank here. Thank you for having me. First of all, your office reports that federal gun arrests are up this year nearly 50 percent. Is that having an impact on the homicide rate, do you believe? Uh, I, would, I would like to hope that it is. I mean, our focus in doing that is really a response to what we're seeing on the streets. We're seeing um, individuals possessing, using, and transferring firearms. Um, you know, in a, in a way that um, is, is leading to a lot of the violence. And so we focused on more individual gun prosecutions than we had in the past. And, and, and so why it was up 50 percent from right. the year prior. Right. So is it just uh, just a renewed focus from your office on it? It's a renewed focus on it. Um, we also we set up um, what we call gun prosecution teams. And we did that with, with some additional resources we received from the Justice Department. And we've essentially embedded certain assistant U.S. attorneys in certain police districts of the city to work directly with the police commanders and their team, an ATF agent and their team, and also the state's attorney's office to really focus on um, 
every gun case that might come across, you know, a police officer's desk in that district, and it, really to do those cases effectively and efficiently. And there, there are hundreds yeah. of gun yeah. incidents in the yeah. city of Chicago yeah. every year. I mean, obviously, yeah. not all of them are going to be federal cases. Right. So how do you prioritize which case falls under some kind of federal statute? Right. So we look. I mean, a lot of a lot of the offenses, you know, have the potential to be federal. I mean, we work very closely with the police department, with ATF, and with the state's attorney's office, really, and figure out where's the best place for this case to go? I mean, sometimes actually the, the state statute is more powerful than the federal statutes for certain um, gun possession offenses. And so we just work with them to really take a look at the evidence, look at the offender, um, look at their criminal history, the nature of this particular incident in which we were able to recover the gun and determine is it better that this case goes federal versus state. And what we're looking for there is ultimately holding that offender accountable. In, 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 I mean, there's there's a gang right. prosecutions right. unit in, right. in your office. Uh, you've used RICO statutes right. to go after gang right. members. But if you hear from people on the ground, they're saying it, it's not so much gangs anymore as it is interpersonal conflict that causes the gun violence. Is that what you're finding? We have definitely seen that. I mean, we have a violent crime section in the office and then a narcotics and money laundering section. And, you know, we still do RICO cases. We still do organized drug trafficking cases run by street gangs. Uh, but we are seeing a much more factionalized set of individuals who are fighting over, you know, things like social media slights, things like that. Um, and the way to attack that essentially is um, is to go after the gun possession or the gun, you know, uh, use that they have in connection with those offenses. And, and of course, there's so many illegal guns that flow into the streets of Chicago. Statistics say that 60 percent come from uh, within uh, the state, but outside of Chicago, 40% from other states. Do you work with U.S. attorneys from other states uh, to, to stem the tide of guns that come in here? We do. We work closely with the U.S. attorney's offices in other states, um, and I've seen different data on that. I mean, the, the state that is, you know, looking at some of the University of Chicago Crime Lab data, which and they do a fantastic job taking, you know, ATF data and Chicago police data, but looking at some of that, most of the crime guns do actually come from Illinois, but when they do come from outside the state, um, you know, we work, you know, very closely with our partners in other states in order to try and identify who is the source of those guns and then actually prosecute people for straw purchasing those guns. And so let me give you one example. There was um, a case that was charged by uh, my colleague up in Minnesota within the last couple of weeks. Um, and this uh, was a straw purchaser case. Um, but it was uh, one of the weapons that was used to shoot a police officer just within the last month and a half or so. Um, outstanding work uh, by law enforcement to ultimately trace the ballistics from that weapon um, ultim up to Minnesota to identify the people who illegally purchased that gun. And the, the U.S. Attorney General William Barr is making news this week saying there's, there's going to be a new um, violent crime initiative coming from the feds called Project Guardian. What can you say about this new initiative? It is, um, I, I think it will indicate that the department continues to be very focused on firearm prosecutions. It continues to be very focused on using um, close contacts with our state and local um, law enforcement connections to, you know, to basically coordinate as best we can to do as much as we can to be as effective as we can um, to work with ATF and the technology ATF has some technology they have on ballistics is outstanding. We can do a lot of work there in addition to some other things related to um, um, get a mental health issues even, um, you know, involving um, certain people who, who may attempt to buy some guns. So more to come on that. And, and, and this is in addition to Project Safe Neighborhoods, which has been another initiative of the last couple right. years to fight violent crime. Can you just give us a rundown of what exactly that does and how it sort of adds to your efforts? Right. So Project Safe Neighborhoods has been kind of the department's, you know, hallmark initiative for years to fight um, violent crime and oftentimes that's associated very closely with gun crimes but really it's much broader than that it's going after gangs guns and drugs you know back when I was in the office beforehand I was an assistant US attorney from 1999 to 2010 um, I did a lot of large organizational drug trafficking cases involving straight gangs that was right within you know project safe neighborhoods as well um, essentially charging drug conspiracy and the like mm -hmm. um, I think this effort here is going to focus much more so on, uh, on firearms it, one of the big problems that's constantly reported with the Chicago Police Department is the homicide clearance rate. So few of, of, of homicides actually get solved. What, what, what do the federal partners do to help that effort? Right. So one of the things we're doing, I mean, is more gun prosecutions. We think that that um, can very specifically help us in some of those cases. If we, um, you know, working with 
uh, the detective um, folks at the Chicago Police Department and also the federal agencies. Um, the FBI in particular does an outstanding job working with the detective division and ATF as well with the detective division in order to identify groups of individuals who may be, you know, working together to commit violent acts and to string together murders and retaliatory murders and shootings and the like. And so we're, we're heavily involved in that. There was a case that we charged um, earlier this year, late last year, against a gang in Englewood where we charged multiple murders and four individuals. And that really was the efforts of kind of using all of our resources to try and clear some of those cases. You know, Mayor Lightfoot has, has been complaining that at least, you know, on the state level, uh, some violent defenders have been let out of prison too early or they're being let out on, um, on, on on bails that are, are 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 pretty easy for them to pay. Are you seeing that too? That that charged offenders are are, are being let out too easily. No. So it's one of the things that we focus on. I mean, we have time federally under the federal bail system. I mean, if someone is picked up on a drug trafficking or a weapons offense, um, we are typically, you know, kind of viewing that as, as someone who is a risk to public safety. And so we oftentimes are asking for that person to be detained pre-trial. Sometimes we're not, but we, we kind of work with law enforcement and then ultimately ask for a little bit of time with our judges in order to, um, you know, be able to make the best case we can for detention, which would be really only for two reasons. One, if someone is a serious risk of flight, or two, if they are a danger to another person or the community. Um, and we would need to make a showing of that and the defense would have the ability to argue there's conditions to mitigate that. Um, so we do that all the time. Um, and you know that's, that's really our focus when we're trying to you know, hold people accountable and kind of stop the cycle of retaliation and violence. And you know, you've had a close relationship with Superintendent Johnson over the last couple of years. Do you know anything about his interim replacement, Charlie Beck from LA? Do you expect the same kind of cooperation? I, I do, I think. Um, I, I actually um, chatted with him very briefly on Friday. Um, I'm looking forward to working with him. Gave him my phone number, said he can call 24-7, just like Superintendent Johnson could. I mean, we are fully engaged in this you know, battle to try and keep people in Chicago safe. So I look forward to working with on him. Another, uh, on another front, yeah. your office has been very busy uh, on public corruption cases. Um, the indictment, 14-count indictment of Alderman Ed Burke, most recently a charge uh, against former state rep Luis Arroyo. You, unlike your predecessors, have, have refrained from giving press conferences or, or public comments about these cases. Why is that? Um, I, I mean, look, I think the, you know, the, the facts of the cases, you know, when we charge them, they, they speak for themselves. And so, um, you know, that's, that's essentially why at, at this point, you know, our people are very busy working in this space. Is, 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 there a, is there a renewed focus on public corruption cases like there is on violence under your tenure? I, I think there's always been a focus on public corruption cases and violent crime cases under my tenure and under, Zach Fardens and, and Pat Fitzgerald and Scott Lassar, you know, back who initially hired me into the office. And so I don't know what I would call it a renewed focus, um, but it's, um, like I said, we are, we're, we're busy. In, in, at the, you know, these cases, what they have in common is uh, allegations that public officials are using their public perch for some kind of private benefit. Is that at the heart of corruption that you want to root out? Yeah, I mean, people want a fair shake, right? I mean, people in, in Chicago, I mean, they, you know, they, they want um, to see things done in a fair and open and transparent way. And so, you know, when we do have situations, and I'm not talking about any specific case, but when we do have situations where people are using their public office for their private gain, that's something that we're going to take a close look at with our law enforcement partners. I want to ask you about a case that's connected to some national headlines in 2014, your office, obviously you weren't there this time, charged a Ukrainian national named Dmitro Firtash for bribery um, and also alleged that he is connected to Russian organized crime. Now it's reported he's connected to some of the business associates with Rudy Giuliani digging up dirt in Ukraine. He's been fighting extradition to your office uh, since then. Do you expect that Firtash will be extradited to the United States? We hope that he will. Um, you know, other than that, I'm not going to comment any further on a pending case. Do, do, do you know why it's taken so long? I can't speak to that. But you, you, do, you, you, you have a feeling that he will be extradited. We, you're hoping that we're, he will be we're, you know, the, We are seeking extradition, and we're hoping to, you know, to bring our case here in court. All right. U.S. Attorney John Lausch, thank you so much. Right. Thank you. And you can catch the new WTTW digital series, First Hand Gun Violence, on WTTW.com slash First Hand. There you can also find talks with community and political leaders, stories from the guns-focused news outlet, The Trace, and a discussion guide and more. And we're back with more Chicago Tonight right after this. This evening's presentation of Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by ComEd. Powering Lives. 
We have a tremendous source of untapped, efficient energy right here in our school. Let her rip, Jenny. I kind of love this idea. <laughs> the ComEd Energy Efficiency Program has real ideas for making schools energy efficient. From the Chicago Blues Club to South Africa, a new show at Steppenwolf Theatre Company explores music and love across cultures. Ladysmith Black Mambazo formed in the early 1960s, and they added their acclaimed harmonies to Paul Simon's Grayson album in 1986. They started to collaborate with Steppenwolf in 1992 with the Song of Jacob Zulu, which went to Broadway. Now they're back in town for their third show at Steppenwolf and we visited them in rehearsal and spoke with some of the creative team. I'm a singer. There's energy in the rehearsal room as the nine members of Lady Smith Black Mambazo perform with an actress and singer who knows them well. I've known them since I was a little girl. I was born in the 1980s in South Africa during apartheid, and when I was three, we moved to New York. And, you know, throughout the 80s and 90s, they would come to New York and perform, um, whether in terms of, like, anti-apartheid protests or performing for dignitaries or Mandela or whomever when they were visiting. So at a young age, I had that connection. We were part of the same community, both culturally but also musically. Once upon a time. The new show is called Lindy Way. It's a cross-cultural love story that takes place in South Africa and Chicago, and the Chicago blues figure prominently. We love the music. Music uh, has that thing that connects everybody, you know. It, it doesn't matter what kind of music. It doesn't matter if you understand the language, you understand the music, but as long as it's uh, good music, it gets in your veins. Lady Smith Black Mambaza was founded by Joseph Shabalala, who's now retired. Family members continue the legacy he began nearly 60 years ago. We started to sing at a very early age, and our father used to teach us singing very early and put us on stage and sing at the church, at the weddings, in many different occasions, so we used to it. Lindy Way features new music from the group. A Steppenwolf Ensemble member recalls their first collaboration in 1992. We invited them here to Chicago to do a workshop. It became kind of this magical you know, moment. We realized that they're an ensemble, we're an ensemble. It, it didn't seem like uh, uh, somebody would say these two groups belong together, but we kind of like clicked. <laughs> The show has been in development for six years. It was an important project to Martha Levy, the late artistic director at Steppenwolf. Martha called me up one day and she said, you know, I was in my car and I was listening to the radio and an old Studs Terkel interview came on where he was interviewing Mombazo. And it reminded me of their work with us and what do you think about calling them up and see if they would like to do another play? And that's how it started. It, it was great to work with Steppenhoff. So when my, f my brother also started to work with them, uh, with Steppenhoff, especially Eric Simonson, uh, who's been out in South Africa many times. Um, so it was very easy to build that kind of a, re a relationship. And when it all comes together, it will be one of the more anticipated productions on stage this season. There's so many different moving parts so many different pieces to this puzzle. So uh, it, it requires an enormous amount, I think, of skill and focus and craft. It's coming together really, really beautifully. Lindy Way just opened at Steppenwolf Theater. It runs through January 5th, and there's more on our website. Up next, an encore presentation of Ask Jeffrey with Brandis Friedman, so stay with us. Don't ever miss Chicago Tonight. Subscribe to our podcast. Get a daily download of our show delivered to your desktop or mobile device. Go to WTTW.com slash Chicago Tonight Podcast and subscribe. What do a 1917 march down Michigan Avenue and a 1934 record-breaking train run have in common? 
publicity. Jeffrey Bear is here with stories of two Chicago publicity stunts, because, hey, they don't call it the Windy City for nothing. Am I right, Jeffrey? <laughs> that is absolutely why it's <laughs> called the Windy you. City. Good to see you, too. So our first question, it comes from Diana Springfield in Springfield. She writes, I found an old stereoscopic postcard in a yard sale showing a huge parade on Michigan Avenue in 1917. What can you tell me about the event? So Diana sent us a cell phone picture of the postcard, so not great quality, but it really caught our attention. So we went to the Library of Congress and we found a really good quality copy of it. There's the photo. Uh, it's captioned, thousands marching, thousands watching our National Army, Chicago, August 4th, 1917. Okay, so that's about a year too early to be a World War I victory parade. What mm -hmm. was it for? Good knowledge of history there. Thank you. It was essentially a, a big propaganda stunt that was cooked up to um, uh, promote the new idea of drafting men into the army, which was a new thing then. Um, the United States had declared war on Germany a few months earlier, and there were only about 121,000 men in the uh, army at that time. It was called the regular, quote, the regular army. Um, so the federal government authorized the Selective Service Act of May 1917. It required all men aged 21 to 30 to register for the draft, and those selected would be conscripted into something new, something called the National Army. And um, so this was real about face for a country that had um, until that point maintained a neutral position in this growing conflict overseas. President Wilson quickly authorized a campaign to gin up support for the draft and the war. Um, it was led by something called the Committee on Public Information, <laughs> or CPI, sure. Information. Uh, and the CPI flooded newsrooms with stories, many of which the newspapers printed verbatim. Um, they sent it, sent uh, also sent around 75,000 speakers called the Four Minute Men. Uh, they went all over the country and gave these four-minute short speeches promoting Wilson's war plans. No Twitter back then. No. Uh, and they produced propaganda films and created stirring posters, including this one, uh, the famous Uncle Sam Wants You. So then was this parade a CPI event? Uh, not directly. It may have had something to do with CPI, um, but it appears to have been a homegrown affair um, inspired by an editorial that was printed in the, um, in the Chicago Tribune. Um, after the editorial ran, a, a local committee was formed. Um, the Trib then ran ads for, from the committee and uh, articles inviting men who had been drafted uh, into the Army. Uh, they were invited to march in this huge parade so the city could give them a proper send-off for their military training. And just weeks after the editorial ran in the paper, 13,477 soon-to-be soldiers uh, in civilian clothes marched up Michigan Avenue behind officers in training from Fort Sheridan. Uh, now 35 uh, of those men whose draft number had come up first. They were called the, the 258 men because their draft number was 258. So their number had come up first, these 35 men, and they were given the honor of leading the enlistees in this parade and they were loudly cheered by the throngs along the street, all this according to the Tribune. Um, uh, the reviewing stand was in front of the Art Institute where recruited, uh, where, where um, U.S. Army Major General Thomas H. Berry observed the recruits, uh, Lieutenant John Philip Sousa, the March King himself, directed the Great Lakes Naval Training Band. Um, and immediately following the parade, Barry wrote, quote, no other city in the United States or in the world ever witnessed a finer sight than the parade composed solely of young American manhood uh, without a slacker in the bunch. Woe betide those whom they go up against on the other side. Interesting, Jeffrey. Thank you. Okay, sure our next one comes from Karen Knapp of Woodstock. She writes, many years ago, my grandmother gave me a framed document because she thought I might be able to use the frame. The document is the log of the Burlington Denver Zephyr world record nonstop run on October 23rd, 1936. It says that John T. Peary was a passenger and that he is therefore a member of the Dawn to Dusk Club. What can you tell me about it? Uh, don't you love this? Here, maybe you just like the frame, right? And then, but do you <laughs> look at it? There's document something inside. In the, yeah, I mean, I, we, we just love these. So our viewer <laughs> sent us a photo of the certificate. So let's start out by taking a look at that. Um, so at first, I assume that this was the super sleek train that many of us have seen at the Museum of Science and Industry, the Burlington Pioneer Zephyr, which in fact made a record-breaking run from Denver to Chicago, but that was in 1934. Um, it is the same streamlined 
design, but it's actually a different train. This is the Denver Zephyr, and this run was two years later in 1936. So, okay, let's back up a bit. Um, the legendary streamliner I referred to, the one that's at the Museum of Science and Industry, um, set its record-breaking dawn to dusk run on May 16, 1934. Um, and that, as we said in the beginning, was a publicity stunt by the Burlington, uh, Chicago, Burlington and Quincy Railroad to demonstrate a revolutionary new kind of lightweight, high speed train powered by a diesel engine instead of by steam. Railroads were desperate for new efficient technology that would cut costs as ridership was slumping during the Great Depression. Okay, so Burling, Pre Burlington President um, Ralph Budd wanted this to be literally the last word in train, so he scouted around for a name that started with Z. Uh, he found inspiration in the name of the god of the west wind, Zephyrus. Look at it go, man, look at that. Um, the goal was to cover the distance in 14 hours, uh, which is actually five hours shorter than the old Denver to Chicago records, which was set by a steam engine, and nearly half the regular time of 26 hours. Um, the big finale was to be the Zephyr's triumphant arrival at Chicago's Century of Progress World's Fair reopening. So did the train make it on time? It got here early. How about that? Hmm. Um, the Zephyr covered 1,000 uh, and 15 miles in just over 13 hours. You want to take a guess at what the fuel cost was? I the total cost of fuel? The total, $15. $14.64. I was so close. You were. <laughs> uh, the, the run and subsequent 31 state publicity tour made the Zephyr a bona fide star. It even starred in a Hollywood movie, The Silver Streak. Um, it was put into regular service from Lincoln to Kansas City in November 1934. Okay, so fast forward to 1936. Um, Two new 12-car Zephyrs, same streamlined design but much larger, much more powerful, were built for regular uh, runs between Denver and Chicago, and so Bud kicked off the service with another publicity stunt. He wanted to break the record of the first Zephyr. So passengers on this 1936 train apparently did receive these certificates, like the one our viewer sent us. Uh, uh, this particular one she sent us was issued to John T. Peary, which is funny because he was, you know, the Carson Peary Scott store. Of course. Um, so we only see these in museums today and not out on the tracks. Why is that? Well, um, it's amazing, isn't it? We used to have high-speed rail in this country, but beginning in the 1950s, you have the interstate highway system. You have, you know, the, the growth of air travel. Railroads go into a, a long, slow decline. Um, the original Zephyr uh, made its last run in 1960 and then was sent to the museum. But the name lives on in Amtrak's California Zephyr. So it had a good long run. Not quite the last word in trains, <laughs> though, was it? <laughs> no, Amtrak. Back to A. Back to A. Oh, you've got it. Thank you, Jeffrey. Good sure to see thing. you. And you can march on over to our website where you'll find more on these and other Ask Jeffrey questions. And don't forget to send in your own questions about Chicago to Jeffrey Bear. And we're back right after this. Ask Jeffrey on Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Benny's Beverage Depot. In 1948, Benny's Beverage Depot opened its first store down the street from Wrigley Field. And for over 70 years, Benny's mission has remained the same, helping you celebrate the best times of your life. And that's our show for this Wednesday night. Please join us tomorrow night live at 7. Chicago Police Superintendent Eddie Johnson on his retirement announcement and more. And a pioneer in heart health is still doing research as he turns 100. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Phil Ponce and I thank you for watching. Good night. Closed captioning for this program is brought to you by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, dedicated to preserving the dignity and rights of all individuals.